So we're going to be looking at the fourth petition. And if you have a catechism, that starts on page 258. 258, the fourth petition. And we're just going to read this part together. So we're going to read the fourth petition and then what does this mean and what is meant by daily bread. So once you get to 258, or you can just follow along on your handout. Give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? God certainly gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to all evil people. But we pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. What is meant by daily bread? Daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, devout husband or wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, self control, good reputation, good friends. Faithful neighbors and the like. That should say like, not like, um, and the like. Very good. All right. So that covers quite a few things. Uh, what is the uh, what is the first thing that jumps out of you when we talk about daily bread? Food. So he said food. Yeah. Right. Um, so if you look over there and pick whatever it is you want to put, pick on the table. How often would you associate chocolate cake or an apple or coffee with the provision of God? Or do most of the time you take granted that you're going to get those things when you want them? Yeah, probably in the second one, right? And I've I, I put myself firmly in that category as well. So one of the things that's always jumped out to me about daily bread is the minute the minuteness of the request, right? That we're talking to the God of all the universe and we're requesting that he give us our daily provisions. And the crazy thing is he does, right? Um, so there's this like juxtaposition of like the really, really big God and then like my really small needs. And yet this is the prayer that our Lord gave us to pray. Give us this day our daily prayer. Okay. So if you've got your catechism on 258, I'm going to read under the central thought here. Take away our daily bread, namely the air we breathe, water we drink, the food we eat, the homes that shelter us, the government that protects us, and we die. Since these things are so important, why do we take them for granted and not express gratitude for them? What do you think? Why do we take them for granted and not express gratitude? Um, well, the other commandment for us was that after we fell, that we were to spoil the land for our own survival. And I think a lot of humans believe that what we receive is based upon our own work. Okay, so what it could be that you don't, you're, you're thinking like, well, this paycheck I got so that I can buy groceries. I earned that paycheck because I went to my job and I worked hard and I got a paycheck, right? And God didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, we would disagree where we say God has something to do with that process. Where is he involved there? He allowed us to have the job. Oh, okay. So he's one of the reasons you got the job. But then the person might say, you know, it was my, my creative ingenuity. It was my experience. It was my expertise, my, my learning that got me the job. I impressed him at my interview. But he gave you that. <laughs> what did he give me? He gave you all of that stuff. Yeah. God gave me all that stuff. My intelligence, my ability to learn my experience and my expertise, right? And so for us as Christians, we trace any of the, those minute things back, they always have one source, which is God, right? Um, and that's part of the reason that Luther has this exhaustive list, right? It's sort of your worst nightmare when you're a confirmation student, you had to memorize that and, and repeat it back to the pastor. You get this long list of things you have to remember, right? Because all of those things have one source in our life that comes from God. And that works well for us in our theology because we have a theology of needs. Um, so let's open up our Bibles to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. And we're going to read 1 to 21. So 
For those of you who don't know, Exodus is close to the front of the Bible, following the book of Genesis. Exodus chapter 16, and we're starting at the first verse. And since it's a long section, I'll just read it so people on the, the call can hear it. All right. They set out from Elam, and all of the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly. And just to set a little context here before I go on, notice that it's, it's like the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So the whole Red Sea scene had just occurred. And the people of God are grumbling that he brought them out of Egypt to kill them through starvation. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to the people of Israel, At evening you shall, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel, Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay upon the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? But they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord commanded. Gather of it each one of you as much as you can eat. You shall take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more or less, some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered, gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let not one of you leave any over until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till morning, and it bred worms and stank. Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, he <clears throat> melted. All right. So you probably have all heard that story before. What does that have to do with giving us our daily? What are a couple of key elements of that story that highlight this part of the Lord's Prayer? Russ? So, human experience building with is you don't trust that God's going to give us our daily bread every day. Uh -huh. So, we want our daily bread and our bread for the next day. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, we want to, we, because we're not trusting in God's daily provision, we want to store up extra just in case, you know, just in case God abandons me and, and you know, yeah. God provides rules, um, and the people can't follow them. Um, and I think that, that that's a huge parallel um, to the law and life. Right. So God gives, and he gives really, I mean, if you ever wanted specific instructions from God, he gives you some really specific instructions. Right. And not only, like, like it, it starts out from a place of mercy. Notice that, right? So the, the people of Israel grumble against God. So God has just done this amazing act of deliverance in Egypt. It's been about two weeks since he parted an ocean when they walked through a dry land. And now they're accusing God that he's led them out through Moses and Aaron into the wilderness to die of starvation. And in response to their grumbling, what does God do? He provides the thing they're complaining about not having. Right? That's an act of mercy, right? Amidst this crazy context where he's done these amazing things, clearly demonstrated 
that I'm God and there are no other. And then the grumbling occurs, and the response that he has to that is to provide what they're grumbling. Yeah. I found it really interesting that you know, here in the first world country, um, things like this go in one ear and out the other. Yeah. But um, in the center you know, of a third world country of viciousness, those people of faith there have such strong faith, and they know that God's going to come through for them. But they don't have anything. They don't know where, they don't right. know where the next one's coming from. Yet they have that faith in God, and they get that. That's actually interesting you bring that up. So the point was made that that often in the first, you know, in first for first world Christians like us, this stuff is just sort of taken for granted, goes in one ear and out the other. But if you're in a third world country, it's a little more poignant, a little more applicable to your your experience. Um, and I was actually going to mention it at some point during this class that we have we had the privilege of knowing a couple of uh, Christians from Liberia, and they would pray with us, and when we did our family devotions when they were staying with us. And the subject of their prayers were fasting. They were very different from ours. Uh, their prayers focused a lot more on basic stuff and appreciation for those basic things. And it's sort of over time, I started thinking about that more and more. It really is that reality that, that where they live, they really are much more thankful or much more aware that they should be thankful for things like waking up and having a new life each day and having food to put on the table. I mean, imagine right now the way the weather's been the last week if you didn't have a house. You'd be dead. You'd be frozen somewhere, right? Uh, I'm always reminded of that when I hear some story about some hikers who got lost, and it's not like they're far from civilization. They're probably just two hours away from something that could save their life, but they're lost, and without all of those extra things, they're left to the mercies of nature, which is not very merciful, right? And so... Uh, and you probably all have different experiences in your life where that became really clear to you, where something that you took for granted or just have always had was taken away for a while or unexpectedly. And then all of a sudden you remember, oh, wait, I don't just get these. I can't just assume that I have them, right? Um, now, does that mean that we should um, condemn our blessings? No. And in fact, if you ever do that in front of somebody who doesn't have those things, they usually get mad at you, right? Because the, and they'll set you straight. They'll say, "Don't, don't be upset that you didn't experience the, the trial that I'm experiencing." I'm glad. It's like I had a friend who told me this about uh, about family. His family life wasn't that great, and I had basically I'd made a similar expression, and he and he said, he said, "Don't do that," because what I know of people who have family experiences like yours. It, be, it helps me know that I can actually be that kind of dad, right? Um, so there's there's a different perspective there, but we each have our own struggles, right? And and this is one of ours in the first world, I think, is taking these first article created gifts for granted, shelter and food and all of that. All right. Um, at the bottom of there on page 258, what habits and practices can help me to better recognize how God sustains my life? Yeah, yeah. How, how many people here pray before they eat their meals or at least try to right. so that's that's good that's a good habit that acknowledges because what are you praying when you pray you're thanking god for for your provision and you're asking him to be present and and you're acknowledging that you know where this stuff came from right and that's a good reminder especially for us in in, in affluent countries right because very easy to forget that that's where that stuff comes from, right? Um, although I've been asking you guys to read the book of Job, so the book of Job pretty clearly demonstrates that that can all go away pretty quickly, right? Um, that the Lord's provision and protection are, are upon us. Right? Uh, what, what other habits? Yeah. Uh, seeing less of the great ones. Yeah, saying less, give away more, right? So uh, we do have in our culture like a you know, save for the future, save for retirement. And I'm not saying those are bad things, but they can become bad things if the security of your life is solely found in those things. But that is the, the warning that Christ gives us about putting our security in money. Right? We usually think of that in more immediate terms. But like, 
You can you can do both of those things while maintaining your trust in God, but it's more difficult unless you're making yourself aware of that or explicitly setting aside maybe more than you're comfortable with to give away or to tithe to the church or whatever. Okay? So like I can't tell you the number of times of the amount of time that I give where I've been tempted to be like, you know what? Would be a huge deal if this month I just cut that back a little bit and do some help spend on this thing. But I'm always worried that if I do that, then I'm not, you know, where do you draw the line? Right. Um, and it reminds me of like that's one thing I can't cut back from because that's where I got all the money. I'm just returning a little bit back to the person who gave me all of what I have, right? Um, so that's kind of a, oh, an example. Right? Okay. Um, let's open up our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, the second question I handed. How is this a prayer of thanksgiving rather than anxiety? How is this a prayer of thanksgiving rather than anxiety? If somebody, when somebody finds that, they want to read it for us. Philippians chapter 4, starting verse 4 to 7. Cooper, you got it? Yeah. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again. I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Oh, does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, right? Um, because really that is like you strip everything else away that is the source of our comfort, our peace and our hope right? is, is Christ himself and what he offers so that means that if I, if I place my security there if I lose my house I lose my money, if I lose my family I can still have peace and hope because of Christ right? because all of those things are temporal and if you lose family, you know that in Christ and the resurrection, that life reigns and reign and not death. Right? So um, then you can, like Job, say, the Lord giveth and the Lord take away. Right? That all of that stuff belongs to him. And that's really what that book is about. Right? The book is not about enduring suffering with grace or all of, all of the sort of moralisms we like to draw from it. The book is about you're not God, which means you're totally at the mercy of God. We always are totally at the mercy of God. I had a professor at the seminary um, do a class on that, on, on Job, and he talked about an episode of the Twilight Zone. Um, you know, some, of, some of us might be too young to have seen a lot of episodes of the Twilight Zone. Uh, but this one in particular, a man is, uh, the, the screen goes black, and the man is walking on the street, the screen goes black, and he wakes up in, in a place that he's, he's not really sure where he's at. And the whole time, the whole episode, he's trying to figure out where he's at, where his surroundings are. And towards the end of the episode, a giant hand comes out of the sky and picks him up and, and is holding him up. And it turns out that what he's in was like basically like an aquarium, like tank in, in this being's room. And there's nothing he can do about it. He's totally at the mercy of this creature because this creature is massive. It's like he's the lizard and the other creature. And that is like our relationship with God. We are completely at his mercy. Right? We're in his world. We are his beings. And so the comfort that's found in Job isn't railing against that, but realizing what God has chosen to do to the creatures that are at his mercy. And the answer to that is, of course, of course Christ. And the Old Testament, the promises of the Messiah. But that is the that's like the, the reality here, and it's actually, I think, quite connects quite well to so give us this day our daily bread. Because what are you acknowledging when you pray that? God's in charge, right? Apart from him, there's no daily bread. Right? Apart from him, there's no daily bread. And so we're recognizing that fact. Yeah. Yeah, just to connect to the, the Exodus reading, you know, when you read that Exodus 16, you can't help but think. Well, maybe they, they really weren't thanking God, you know, the stuff in Philippians, or they weren't thanking and they weren't praying. And so, at least when I read it, it sounds like, well, okay, they, they were maybe at the point of, of starvation before they finally pray, God, can you give us our daily bread? <laughs> it's right. like, well, maybe if they, you know, I mean, not to second guess that, I'm not a good but. Um, well, but 
but so, they, yeah. the, so this is actually the, the purpose of that story is to highlight God's mercy. It's, it, it's, so it's the, God's mercy is juxtaposed next to the unbelievable ungratefulness of the people who's just rescued from slavery. I mean, even to the point where they're expressing delusion. They were not sitting around meat pots and eating bread to the full. I mean, the whole reason he came and rescued them is that they were all crying out to God under great oppression, right? Um, and so what is highlighted there, which ties in very nicely with this prayer, is that despite the fact that even in starvation they didn't pray to God, what did they do? They complained and grumbled against him, the text says, but he still has mercy in their lives, right? And, and there's, you know, it wasn't too far beyond that chapter where they were complaining about having nothing but man and quail. Right. Now, now, why do you think that that, um, well, other than that's the reality of the sinful human state, right? But that is actually of great comfort to us as we read the scriptures. It's of great comfort to us because it, it shows us that God came for people like that, people like us. So have you ever felt when you confess your sins on Sunday, you're like, man, I'm here again, and it's the same thing, and I feel like scum because I've, I've done this like 37 times this year or whatever it is, right? And you think, how come I don't know better? I mean, I know Jesus. I believe in him. He's revealed his word to me, and yet I'm still here every Sunday confessing these sins. Uh, and you feel helpless. Right? And then you get, you know, then you read the words of Paul and Romans, right? The good that I desire to do, I never find myself doing. And the thing that I always wish I wouldn't is what I find myself doing. And then you can almost hear the despair. Who is going to rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God for Christ Jesus. And so this illustration of the, this, these almost like, and it's really tempting to, to just rag on them because it's unbelievable. You're like, no, listen, if I was there, I mean, I saw the ocean split in half for crying out loud. There's no way I would be complaining. You would. If you're right there with them. And that's the, that's that's sort of the, the point. Right? That's what's being revealed there is that that even if that's your reaction to God's action in your life, he, he is merciful. Right? Okay. With always gave me peace in, in reading for Exodus. Have these guys who are Moses is going up to get the law. They see the white light up in the mountain. They know something spectacular is happening. But they're like, you know what? Moses is going. Get all the gold. Let's make a cap and let, let, let's start, let's start praying to him. Okay. But God still took care of them. And obviously they, they, they turned their back as hard as they possibly could, praying to something that doesn't really exist. Instead of God, who they know exists, right? and yet He still took care of them. Well, we know, like the Exodus story is the one that people know the most out of the Old Testament. That's really the entire Old Testament. That's the cycle of the entire Old Testament. Is God does something amazing for His people? They show appreciation for about three seconds, and then the remainder of the book is Him calling them back to Himself because they didn't teach to their children or their children's children, and so now they're all worshiping other gods, and they're living off of the benefit and blessing of the. Of, of when God, you know, and so that's why it's, you know, in, the, in Psalms, the focus is, is telling the, the generations, the generation of the mighty works that God has done. And I think it's in Joshua chapter two, when he warns them, it says, don't, um, don't intermarry with the Canaanites and tell your kids what I have done for you. And they don't do that. And in two generations, no one knows about Exodus. That has always struck me, right? And so there's this emphasis on like maintaining this picture of keeping in front of you what God has done, right? So it, for us as New Testament Christians, of course, we talk about excess and things. But what's the main focus of the mighty work that God has done that we are to tell? Christ, right? The cross and the empty tomb, right? So that's why maybe somebody who doesn't really get it thinks it's boring coming to church, like, oh, you're always talking about baptism, you're always talking about community, you're always talking about this Jesus guy. I can't move on. It's like, no, there's nothing to move on to. Right? That's the whole point. Right? And he's coming back. So this is what we're about, right? And, and, and so scripture is really the cycle of God calling his people back to himself through mercy, through prophets, through his word, right? 
and then of course ultimately bringing us back through Jesus. And so it's actually a, a point of extreme comfort for us to read that, like, be like, you read about some of the, the stories of the people of Israel, and you're like, man, these people are schleps. What's wrong with them? Like, God just did this amazing thing. And then, then of course, you realize, like, no, okay, that's I, the character in the story that is me is, is the character I just made fun of. Right? Um, and then the great news is that that character you just made fun of receives the mercy of God, right? Despite not, not deserving it. So that really sets it up to answer that, that last question. How is this a prayer of thanksgiving rather than an anxiety? Because God's provision is not law-based. Okay? We even said that in the what does this mean? God certainly gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to all evil people. Right? So God's mercy and provision is not law-based. It's not based on you doing X, Y, and Z, and then I will give you this as a reward. And the story from Exodus clearly illustrates that. They didn't do any, any good things in order to earn the provision of God, if anything. They were, he would have been justified in being like, well, you know what? I just did all that stuff for you, and you have sinned against me over and over again. I'm just going to let you start. I'll, I'll keep Moses and, and maybe Aaron and maybe Joshua. I believe the biggest stars, you know, in the Bible, it's do what God wanted. Uh, a couple chapters before the Exodus, we read, God, or Jesus, Moses was saying, hey, get someone else to do it. I can't do what you ask me to do. A couple chapters after what we read, uh, he said, hey, God, you and I, man, we're going to get water out of that rock. Yeah. Right. Yeah, good. And, and that, I mean, that is, is serving that point again, that there are, like, specials you get it and non-specials you don't. Right? We're all in the non-special category until Jesus comes along, and then he's the one who makes us special, and it's all his doing, none of ours, right? Uh, we had a, a president of the synod, Matthew Harrison, uh, preached a really great sermon when I was at the seminary in our chapel service, and he started out just by hammering us with the law, and he had a great gospel term in it. So the way he started, he said, he said, you know what? You guys are a bunch of drunkards. And liars, cowards, and just whole litany of horrible things. He said, but you know what the great news is? You fit right in with everyone that God's ever touched in the Bible. <laughs> right? Making that exact point that like Moses was a coward, he didn't want to do something. I mean, to the point where like God almost, you know, if God could get exasperated, that's maybe what it would look like. He says, Who made man's mouth? Like, hello, who are you talking to? Like, I'm sending you, you're good to go, right? And he's still like, oh, you know, could you send somebody to help, right? So this, this reoccurring theme, which actually is kind of a nice segue we, the, for the fourth petition, is that God is the source of all good. After the fall, there are no special superstars. There are all fallen creatures in need of Satan. And that's also what we're expressing here, and give us this day our daily bread. Right? Not just in the big need of salvation and the cross of Christ, but we're even dependent on God for daily food, shelter, etc. Right? Any questions or thoughts about the fourth petition? Okay. So now we'll get to the fifth petition. Um, that's on page 264 in your catechism. Uh, and I would encourage you, we don't have time to go through all of the questions in the back here of the catechism, but they are worth looking into and, and reading on your own. They give you a lot of really helpful scripture references for the particular question that's being answered. So I'd encourage you to look at that. And after, at the end of each section on page 261, you can see there's a connections and application section um, where they talk about like, practically what does that look like in my life. Um, okay. So page 264, fifth petition, let's read that together. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What does this mean? We pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them. We are neither worthy of the things for which we pray nor have we deserved them, 
and we ask that he would give them all to us by grace, for we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but much. So we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. All right. So this one is a big one. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Is that an exciting statement or a scary one? Yes. <laughs> yeah, both. Very good. All right. What's the exciting thing about this? Yeah, that we get forgiveness from God, right? His answer to our request for forgiveness every time is your sins are forgiven because of what Christ has done, right? What's the scary part about that? That we have to forgive, right? And, and so that's where um, forgiveness actually has a realm both in the law and the gospel for the Christian, right? The gospel realm for forgiveness is that you receive that gift freely by grace through Jesus, regardless of your, like, not related to your works at all, right? That's the gospel, right? The free gift of God. The law part is that now that you have been forgiven, you are commanded also to forgive. Um, and that can be scary because that's not qualified by any sort of degree. It doesn't say you are to forgive just little things. It doesn't say you're to forgive just people you like. It doesn't say you are to forgive for these seven things in the record. Hold a grudge for it. Right? It just says we are to forget, right? And what's the basis for that command? What's the basis that we are to forgive everything? Christ said that on the church. Yeah, so it's a well, it's a command, but why is it a command? Why is he giving us that command? What's the what's the term there? Christ forgave us by taking all of our sins. Right. So the basis for the, the, the command that you forgive others for everything they do against you is that I have forgiven you for everything you have done against me. That's your whole your whole basis, your whole foundation, your whole standing is grounded in the forgiveness of Christ. Um, and so, therefore, he commands to forgive in all things. Right? Now, does that mean, then, that we just, like, accept everything in the world as it is? No. Why? That would, would that be mean? How does that not mean it on earth? Okay, so you want the best for people, and if they're sinning, they're not getting the best, right? Okay, it's a way of expressing it. Because what God wants for you is good, and the good is the best, right? Um, and not like good as in you're really good at kicking a soccer ball, but good as in morally good, right? So as a Christian, then, if we see somebody doing something that's not morally good, what is, what is, how do we love that person? Huh? Teach, okay. Pray. Okay. Share the love, share the law and the Okay, right. So let's say um, it's a it's a fellow brother in Christ that goes to your church and they're doing something, or a brother or sister wants to become a guy's here. Um, and you you know that they're doing something they shouldn't do. And in order to love them as Christ has called you to love them the same way he loves you, what do you do? You right, right, right. You, you do what Jesus did to the Holy Spirit. You rebuke using God's word, of course, not your own. Um, and the goal of that rebuke is not to make them feel bad, but to bring them to repentance and away from the thing which is harmful. Right? But let's say we get that example um, where the person isn't a member of your church and isn't even Christian. By example. <laughs> Okay, that's part of it. By example, right? So you want to demonstrate by your continued interaction with them that, like, the way your life points to Christ. What else? One of the things we forget as Christians that the law is, is indeed good for us. Um, none of the law was given for us to be harmful to us. It's all made to make us better. So if you explain why what they've done is part of them, um, it would be well received. And, and that can lead to a gospel moment um, where we can share. 
Maybe. We're talking about the context of forgiveness. Yep. We're not talking about a general, we see somebody sick. Right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who is not Christian. Well, we're talking, talking about we're, if, talking. we're talking about if forgiveness means that you just sort of let things be. All this forgive. What does forgiveness even mean? Does it involve? Are you just generally to be offended by anybody that you in the world? Or are we talking about personal sin against you requiring forgiveness? That's really well. So we, I mean, essentially, the the, the, the the high level of answer is the same in both situations, right? Because forgiveness is ultimately tied to the love of Christ, right? And so. You're, what you're interested in when it's not particularly applied to you is not their forgiveness of something they've done to you, but their reconciliation with God. So, so you're concerned with their forgiveness of Christ. So therefore, what do you tell them about? I guess I don't understand this speaking to me. I should be offended by the sin of everybody else. Well, I'm not saying you're offended. Okay. I'm not saying you're offended. Your, the basis of your love for your neighbor is not based on your personal offense right. of their wrongs. Right? What is the basis of your love for your neighbor? The love of Christ, right? So if somebody is not a member of your worshiping, believing community, and they're doing something that is that is not that we believe to be not good for them, right? For the believer, we lead with a rebuke from the law because we can assume. Like, hey, you and I go to the same church, we believe the same stuff. Here's what we believe says, right? But you can't make those assumptions with somebody who isn't a part of your believing community. And so the way that forgiveness reflects the love of Christ in that particular instance is you're trying to connect them to forgiveness in the first place. Not your own personal forgiveness. They probably haven't done anything necessarily to you. But out of your concern of love, based on that forgiveness in Christ, you don't want to just let them be. So sort of what I'm addressing here is the propensity to say, well, if, if we are to forgive others as we've been forgiven, that means we never we never do any sort of aid in preventing people from sinning or pointing them to Christ and that sort of thing. And I don't think that's true. But you do approach it differently based on somebody who is a Christian and someone who's not. Right. So you wouldn't lead with the law, is what I'm getting at. Because they're, they need, before any of that other stuff, the forgiveness of Christ. Right? Because what changed, what changed your heart? Was it the Ten Commandments? Or was it the Gospel of Jesus? Right? And then what comes after that is the law. Right? And, then, and then your desire to learn the law and live according to the law. Now, the law is not totally useless given some of the particulars and circumstances because the Bible does tell us that the law of God is written on our hearts men. Um, but it's usually not effective to lead with that when you're speaking to somebody who doesn't believe in the scripture or believe no God necessarily in the first place, right? And so your goal is to, to bring them in connection with the forgiveness that you have received, which comes from Christ. Yeah, Jim. There are times when if my life goes through these emotions, Oh, that's a good question. Is there a time limit for forgiveness? Um, so the question was, am I allowed to kind of go through all the emotions that I need to go through with records? So in a certain sense, there is no time limit to forgiveness. Um, so a couple of thoughts. One, there is no time limit to forgiveness other than what the scriptures say, which is when Christ returns, the time period for mercy is over. Right. Um, so that means that there's if you're holding on to a grudge of, of spiritual magnitude that it, and it causes your faith to harden and shatter, and the axes come to the root of the tree and Christ has returned, the time for you to reconcile that is gone. Okay. Beyond that, there really is no time limit. But I would caution you, the second thought is, that when you get to the point where somebody, and this is, I would say this is, if somebody has approached you in, in repentance and apologized, and you are not yet ready to forgive, right? that is founded always in self-righteousness. So the person that is now in spiritual danger in that altercation is you. Right? So by withholding forgiveness, the only person you're harming, I think usually we think that we're harming that other person, we're 
showing them that like what you did really hurt me, and so I can't just I can't just say hey, you're forgiven, right? But spiritually speaking, according to the scriptures, the only person you're harming by withholding forgiveness from somebody who's apologized to you is you. And I would recommend not. <laughs> now, does that mean that your your forgiveness isn't real because you weren't able to do it right away and you had to really mess with it? No, of course not. But that would be my encouragement to you is to think about it in that sense. Is that always that sense of urgency when I pray that that forgiveness that's right there in front of me. So I, I know I can say it's not real for me to write it. I ultimately God sees me. Well, okay, so here, there's actually uh, one of the questions. Ah, on 268, since you're talking about it, we'll skip to there. Under connections and applications, does forgiveness mean that I must forgive and forget? Right? No, forgiveness does not mean having no memory of past wrongs. Right? But we ask our Father in heaven to free us from the anger and resentment that may accompany those memories. So it's not like you're to pretend that didn't happen. But what you're doing is you're no longer holding what happened against the other person. That's that's the desire of forgiveness. And so, um, and it has to be actively expressed. People won't just pick up on that. So you can't, like for the Christian, you can't forgive somebody in your head and then not express that forgiveness to them. Right? So forgiveness allows you to continue to have a relationship that you have to or you want. Yeah, so the goal of forgiveness is reconciliation, which is the healing or the repairing of a wound in a relationship. But even more so um, on the individual level, like holding on to a grudge is like spiritual poison. And usually it doesn't stay just that. Like what happens then is your anger and your resentment builds, and then maybe it spills over in other aspects of your life and causes further harm. Um, so uh, like... If you've ever if you've ever known somebody who's experienced serious trauma that they bottled up, it doesn't stay bottled up. It doesn't stay in that one spot. It spreads out and starts affecting other things. And that's the impression that Scripture gives us of holding on to grudges, right? And again, this is like what Pete said: is the reason that we're commanded to forgive is for our own good, right? It's not good for us to to withhold that. Uh, Russell, maybe. So I love that image um, that. Jesus gives us uh, something like literally laying your gift, like dropping your gift to the altar and going and being reconciled with your brother. Because like, imagine if someone was working for communion and you just like, out the side door. You know? But the idea, I think, is sure, they, the other person wants that reconciliation should happen as soon as possible. But if you're holding that in your heart, it, it destroys even your worship because that's the voice of right. that says, I'm not worthy of this. Right. So, That's a great point. It hurts you. Right. Yeah. So you're holding that in there, and the point was made that it even hurts your your ability to worship God um, because it it gives you it gives the devil in your own sinful flesh all kinds of ammunition to accuse you of your unworthiness, and you yourself are in a place where you're more susceptible to believe it. Too. I, I just want to say, Russ is reading the same Bible I am. Uh, I was going to bring up that scripture that, you know, if you're, if you're troubled with your brother, go and make amends with your brother before you come back to the altar. Um, and if that isn't, you know, God saying, take care of this for your own good, um, I don't know what it is. Right. So. Well, and what is one of the great gifts that, that God has given the church the ability to do? Forgive, right? When he, when, whenever Peter makes that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then he says, upon this confession, build my church. And then he says, anything that you forgive here is forgiven in heaven. Anything you withhold from heaven so is withheld, right? And so the church has been given this responsibility, this great gift of providing forgiveness of sins, right? So usually when I'm talking, when I was at my previous congregation, I was talking to juniors and seniors in high school because I know they're about to go look for a church and wherever they go to college. And they're going to be largely doing it on their own. I try to give them some really simple things to look for. One of them is, if the church you go to never pronounces the forgiveness of sins, find a new church. Just talking about forgiveness rather than applying forgiveness is very different. And over time, the weight of that builds up and often unconsciously, right? So have you ever felt a particular release of pressure or um, attention in your body when the 
you hear the forgiveness of sins, perhaps you want to talk to him. That you heard, yeah, I get it. I know about Jesus. I know what he did. I know he's merciful. But then when someone says, no, you have received that mercy. It's very different. Very different terms. Um, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. 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 All right. How can you forgive someone if they don't accept the forgiveness? And also, if you still feel the pain you know, from the sin, uh, is it really forgiveness? So, um, well, so as illustrated by some of the examples here, forgiveness is forgiveness a one way thing or a two way thing? It's a one way thing, right? Because there's two players in there and each have their part to play, right? So, uh, an example I gave uh, in another class one time is if you have person A and person B, and person A wrongs person B, who's in spiritual danger? Person A, right? Because they've sinned against uh, they've sinned against person B. So what do they need to do? They need to repent and they need to go and apologize to person B. Because you don't expect somebody to come and forgive you for something you haven't apologized to. And they're not going to do that to you. They're not going to be like, you know, I know you haven't thought of it yet, but in my magnum, and you know, I'm just so magnanimous that I'm going to come and forgive you of this thing you did to me that was wrong. Because they may be like, well, shoot, I don't think that was wrong. Go away, right? So person A apologize to person B, right? And now who's in potential spiritual danger? Person B. Because what is person B's response that's commanded by God? To be. Forgiveness, right? So if a forgiveness has been offered and that person rejects the forgiveness, then the person who's doing the forgiving isn't, they're, they're not like on the hook for this person's rejection. Now you do want to now now you have a new mission, right? Now you're concerned for them not because you wronged them, but because they can't accept your forgiveness. And that puts them in spiritual danger. And so you want to encourage them or find somebody else who can encourage them, right? Um, to do that. Because I've seen that actually in my own ministry when somebody really holds on to something like that. It's not very good. Uh, like I said earlier, it doesn't stay in that one spot. Um, okay. <clears throat> We can, yeah. Somebody does something upset about it. Yeah. Right. So the only reason they're asking they're asking to uh -huh. the only reason I'm doing that is because he's okay. So There's nothing to do with me. Getting into heaven. So if I never forgive them, what's that? If you never forgive them? I just drive myself crazy right there. Um, I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, so essentially, like, I can't say with any sort of scriptural authority that you will for sure go to hell if you hold on to grudges and don't forgive them. Um, but that's kind of the expression that scripture has sometimes, um, where, like, I'm thinking of the parable of the unfaithful servant. Right, so the, the parable of the unbelieving servant, the servant is forgiven like this unreal debt to his master. He has no hope of ever being. And then he goes out and chokes out his fellow servant and throws him in jail for like a day's worth of wages. And the master finds out about it, and it doesn't end up very good for the servant who would help forgiveness. So there is, it's sort of like somebody who says, well, I believe in God, but I don't need to go to church. And my response is, do that at your own peril. But the scripture talks about needing to be connected not only to a community of believers but to the word as it's been given to the church. And if you know you're just going out and experiencing God in nature, I can't say for sure that your faith is not going to last, but every indication of scripture cautions against that kind of behavior. And this is in that similar category. It's really strongly don't do it. Don't don't hold on to that stuff. Right? Um, so you know, this point about you know someone's going wrong. You're not really friends with that person. So it's like it's almost impossible to come to someone and say, well, you know, you shouldn't be the way you say You say, well, it's none of your business and that's what you're wrong. So you're sure. Trying. I mean, I would imagine this is praying to God. 
say, hey, get this guy straight. Sure, but you can also, well, so in that example, the, the realm of forgiveness that would be in your control would be your forgiving your neighbor for punching you in the face. The rest of it is not really have anything to do with your realm of forgiveness. So it should be well, I mean, you 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 may be called to say that to them and endure that response. Um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why our society, based upon values of Christian faith, allows you to report things like that. But the forgiveness that we're talking about here in that example you gave would only be like if you held on to an anger and resentment what they did to you, and then eventually what that ends up leading to is like you wishing. Like, oh man, well, this guy's horrible. I hope he dies. I hope he goes to jail. Right? All those sorts of things. And then, then somebody needs to read First Corinthians 13 again about what love does, right? Um, and really, in general, what is the, the discipleship of Christ is about dying to self, right? You're taking the cross to follow Christ. You're crucifying the old sinful flesh. And forgiveness is like the epitome of that, right? Because what wants you to hold on to, like, a grudge wants you to withhold forgiveness. It's that old self, right? You want to preserve that old self. You want you want to uh, preserve your own dignity. And I'm just, you know, this is just too much. I can't, I can't. Right? And the call of the, the disciple, the follower of Christ is um, that that self dies. And so in forgiveness, what you're doing is you're putting that self to death. And you're not letting it have the word said. The new self who puts on Christ as the word, and the word is forgiveness and love. Right. Yeah, so to tie that back, I think, to what Mike was asking earlier, you know, does this apply to all these other people out there, right? The, and, I, and I feel like on that end, you know, it, when we get into gossip, right, it's easy to say, oh, so-and-so, you know, did this to, to so-and-so. And then we get indignant, right, and say, oh, my gosh, that's terrible. But that's not, we're not in that situation. We're not part of that for right. that sin, right? Yeah. And we're really that was uh, my so example was probably not great. That that was, was getting at. Yeah. you talked about full realm of forgiveness. I thought was, that yeah. So the, the, the only the only point I was making there in the example maybe confused it was that what forgiveness doesn't mean generally speaking is that yeah it's all okay you're good to go right, right. Um, and, and it's because that is a propensity like in our culture in the Western world in particular. That Christians can take at times is like, well, we're just supposed to love and accept everybody and forgive everybody for all their wrongs. It's like, well, true, but that's that's also only part of it, right? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's like so, a knife edge, right? Yeah. Because you're, you're trying not to, you don't want to want to unnecessarily inject yourself into other situations, other conflicts that you're party to. Right. Um, but we also don't want to endorse it. I mean, we but we don't want to be consumed by it, right? And, and say, oh, I hate this person because. It's a, I mean, that's easy, right? It's very easy to fall into. I have an intense dislike for this person, and it's only because somebody else told me bad stories about them. Right. right. Or, or it can be like, and this isn't like, a, the example wasn't like a total stranger. It's like somebody you know, but they're not Christian, right? And so they're not necessarily going to play by the same rules that you play by, nor can you really expect them to, because they don't believe in it, right? And that's why you would lead with the gospel in that situation, and you're trying to connect them not with your forgiveness, because Mike pointed out they maybe didn't do anything, right? Um, but you're observing something that you're thinking from what I know about the world and what God has revealed to me through Christ. What they're doing is not good for them, and so what I want to do is is connect them to Jesus, and then the rest of that other stuff comes from that, right? And, and so the point I was making is you don't want to lead with like the legalism of the law that doesn't change hearts. The forgiveness of Christ is what changes hearts in the gospel. So that was that was the, the point there, is that and the, the change that comes with that forgiveness. So often we think, um, sort of actually related to the sermon today, right? We often think that the only authority by which we can convince people of anything about Christianity is the authority of persuasion, which is the, the law, the logic, the, the argumentation, right? Um, but really, the, the great power that we have for, uh, that we've been given for, um, working change in the world the way God wants is the gospel, which is the authority, the authoritative word of Jesus, which is an authority of station and status as God, not authority of persuasion, right? So, like, was, was Paul ever persuaded that what he was doing was evil and incorrect? 
No, he was just confronted with God. And God said, hey, Paul, or Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's like, who are you? Like, I'm the Lord. And then Paul's like, well, crap. And i got to reevaluate some things here, right? And so that's sort of what the, we understand the Holy Spirit does, right? The Holy Spirit, unbeknownst to us, we don't know what he's going to use, what word we say or action we do that maybe we're not even aware of. And he comes in bringing that authoritative word of God from station and status of God to create faith in someone's heart. It has nothing to do with my eloquence or my ability to argue a point. Right? And that was, that's what I was saying, that the forgiveness component there is Christ's forgiveness in my heart. As opposed to when it's involving you in the in the community of believers, it's a deeply personal thing. And then so and Matthew, where the, the scripture reference you made for us illustrates that, right? That there is a, a personal element to that in the Christian community, as well as the relationship with God. For you, you know, if you haven't reconciled to your brother, you should probably go do that before before getting back here to worship. Yeah. Um you, you, uh, you use the language um to withhold forgiveness as our own self trying to be strong. And our true strength is in being humble to the Lord. Um, and, and, and that is an essence of tension within us all the time. Well, again, that's that because that's the new self and killing the old self. Right. The old right. self doesn't like being killed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yet, yet we're surrounded by the world going, oh, don't take that from him. Right. But Which some, you know, Jesus told us that's that's what was going to happen. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we just kind of have to take that from him and, and go, I forgive you. Well, think about what's a stronger witness to somebody who is peaceful, like really at peace and secure. Is it somebody who, like, if, if do you think that somebody is secure when you see them like lash out at somebody for doing something that, that you probably think is like. I mean, sure, that wasn't right, but it wasn't a huge deal, and that person just exploded. Like, the first word that comes to my mind is they were insecure about something. They really wanted you to know that they weren't insecure, so they were like, Arr! right? Uh, what does that bear witness to? But if somebody does something awful to you, I, I one, for example, I heard a story of uh, something I was always afraid of when I was driving in the Amish country in Ohio is that I was going to crest the hill. There was going to be a little Amish buggy there, and I was going to be in this impossible situation with a car on the other side. That, you know, well, it, it, in fact, somebody shared an example with me. There was a guy that actually hit one of those, and like as a result of it, this Amish couple, like two of their kids died. Right? But the only reason anyone knows anything about that story is because they went to the prison and verbally forgave the man who killed their kids. So what are they bearing witness to? Christ. Right? That there are things greater than death. And that God had forgiven them everything, so they have to forgive this guy. Right? So that, and that brings whole new meaning to in the Psalms when it says you have forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Right? It's not a light or easy thing to have to forgive the wrong that's committed against you. But yet we're called to do that. Right? And again, it's the dying to the old self. The old self doesn't want to go. It wants to hang on. Uh, Dave, you have First, I'm using a dead word. The, uh, I think here, it's clearly the, the personal as you know, it's, it's a forgiveness. Forgiveness has us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I don't think you were suggesting that you have to forgive others who take trespass against us. But you're saying, in effect, yeah, that was an aside. That was more to like confront yeah, you the potential abuse of situation. Right. That's a whole different thing. But right. I think that where you probably were the sentence of making salvation versus damnation would be the inquiry there. Right. Well, and, and that is a, a temptation you always have is like you always want to come up with the sort of vacuum sealed hypothetical example where this thing in scripture may not work perfectly. Um, that's a really fruitless exercise. <laughs> I had we had a guy in our class that was really good at that. He was really smart. And at one point he brought up one of those hypotheticals and the teacher said, Have you ever met anybody like that? 
No? Okay, what do you do? Ask me that question again. And I, and I thought about it for a while afterwards, and it really illustrated a big point, right? That we can get ourselves distracted by these really, you know, getting the minutia of these questions or the philosophy of, well, is this always the case if X, Y, and Z and B and C are all true or whatever? But really, what we need to do is just look at what, what does the scripture say about forgiveness? And then do that, right? And do our best by God's grace to do that. Right? Now, it doesn't mean you can't spend some time thinking about when and where that might be, you know, it may break down or whatever, but don't use that as an excuse, which I think often what it is, especially in the academic circles, in my experience, that's used as an excuse to do nothing. Like, well, I found this weird tiny example that probably will never happen where it doesn't work. So I'm just not going to do it the rest of the time. Right? Um, that's not really what we're getting at, we're getting at here, right? And so the scriptures just tell us that we've been forgiven everything, so we ought to forgive everything. So we do our best to do that. And then we're going to fail, we're going to confess and receive forgiveness. And the cycle continues until Christ returns. Yeah, I think it's more actual I've never experienced this. <laughs> so the good person is going bad, right? You're, you're the object of the person. I always thought that it's really not a good thing right there to say, calm down, start forgiving people. If you wait for the next day or two and say, when they're calm, it'll put you two guys get the reason. Well, here's a good way to think about that, that's right? Every, and I agree with that. That's every conversation in the Italian family. Ron knows this. <laughs> but it's a good way to think about it. Is that in, that, in, that, in that moment, right, who's in charge in that person's mind, right? The old self and the new self. When the old self is in charge, it's probably going to be fruitless to say, like, okay, let's calm down, let's chill. And probably the best course of action is, like, let's separate these two people yeah. and give them time to cool off. And then you can probably notice when the new self takes back over, right? When they are open to that. Um, I've also found out when somebody's really irate with you, saying calm down. All right. Okay. So I will close with this question. It's the second question on your handout because I think it's a pretty powerful one and worth thinking of. On your uh, fifth petition you know, letter B, are there people in my life with whom I am not at peace because I have not forgiven? And so I think as we leave today, I want you to think about that. Really think about that. Because as we've discussed, if you're withholding forgiveness, it's no skin off their nose, really. Right? It's, it's harming you spiritually. It's just clinging to the old self. Um, and so if that is something that's going on, Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, maybe you haven't spoken in a long time. Pray about God releasing that anger and that resentment from you so that you can reconnect and forgive and reconcile. All right. All right, let's close the word. Dear God, we thank you for the gift of forgiveness. We're so grateful that you have forgiven everything we have done against you. A debt that we couldn't possibly hope to. And we ask your grace, your encouragement, and your spirit to be with us so that we too forgive others when they wrong us. So that others can see you with us. And that's the ultimate goal of our life, is to point others to you. May we do this well. And please release anyone here or anyone we know from the danger of holding on to the grudge. Help them to be released from that anger, that resentment, that hurt and offer forgiveness and to set us free, just as you have set us free from sin and death. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.